So, Darren, oh, fuck. <laughs> fuck it. <laughs> all right. We'll do the opening all over again. So, Darren, what are we doing this season? We are doing something called Cool, Cruel Summers. Which has to deal with uh, the movies that came out in each particular year of the 80s during the summer months, correct? The, the, yeah. the summer blockbusters. Absolutely, yeah. Taking from the start of May till the end of August. You know, we've picked kind of 10 movies a week, 10 or 11 movies a week that came out during those summer months. We'll take a look at them. We'll give our thoughts on them. And also discuss how well they did and whether or not the summer was cool or cruel to that particular movie. So, you know, there's going to be no Banana Rama songs here or anything like that. It's just going to be purely movie based and whether or not the, the summer was cool or cruel to these particular movies. And it's, it's, you know, there's some big movies we're going to talk. You know, it's given us an opportunity to, to do something, you know, not outside of horror, but something flex our wings a little bit and talk about movies that we probably wouldn't normally talk about yeah and you know in every year we'll have some key moments that necessarily don't have to deal with movies but i think and i think you also will agree with me uh, darren that to quote cnn the 80s is the decade that made us everything was bigger and better than the previous decades uh, before 19 before the 1980s yeah and 1980 itself had some really kind of key moments. I mean, for example, Ronald Reagan elected as US president. Argentina invaded the Falkland Islands, which was a huge deal for the UK. We kind of went to war with those guys and won. (laughs) (laughs) Without the US's help. (laughs) And also TV audiences were gripped by who shot JR. I actually remember that. I remember the whole thing of JR on Dallas getting shot and you know having to wait god knows how long before it came back again and 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 I think the thing was that unlike today there was no internet and things like that it aired in the US weeks and weeks before uh, Mm -hmm. before it aired in the UK and still we didn't have a clue who fucking shot him (laughs) but unfortunately there was also some sad moments that happened in 1980 uh, you know, Bond Scott passed away, you know, from ACDC. Yeah. You know, but, but ACDC uh, lucked out with Brian Johnson. I mean, right. what, what, most, what bands actually get a singer that was either, that was equal to their former singer? Not many. Not, not many at all. And, and what's really fascinating about that is that within three months of Bond Scott dying, they'd, <laughs> they'd found Brian Johnson, recruited him, and recorded an album with him. And so by July, literally four months after Bon Scott had died, there's an album in the shops with Brian Johnson as lead vocalist. That would multi, take forever. Multi platinum. Multi yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. I mean it was it was it's the second most second biggest selling album in the US after Thriller. Correct. Which is just, a, yeah, that's just a, 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 incredible. And then also in, in music news as well, poor John Lennon assassinated. Yeah, unfortunately, you know, and then uh, and a couple, I think a couple years later, the uh, erected Strawberry Fields in Sh- Central Park, which has actually become his shrine. Yeah. Um, yeah. To world peace and hopefully all of us getting along. Um, I think we could use a little bit more John Lennon right now. Yeah. Uh, but you know what? It also ended on a good note with music is that it looks like 1980 was going to be the death of disco. Maybe not with the movies we talk about because you still hear some of it, but we're getting out of that disco phase, aren't we? Well, yeah, and it, and it, it there's there's two movies that are coming up that we're going to talk about where one really takes the piss out of disco and the other one really takes it seriously. Um, but we'll get there in a minute. We'll get there in a minute. But first... First, and what better way to kick off this this season three and this with this kind of rundown of all these great eighties movies? With May 9th, nineteen eighty, was the release of this horror classic. One, two, three, four, five, 
I think you and I have bashed us enough. For those for those of you who haven't heard it, we have done an episode on Friday the 13th and our problems with it. Now, you know, we were a little cruel to it, but look, it's a, it's for us it's it has a lot of problems. It has a lot of problems both with the the twist in the movie and also some of the dumb decisions that some of the people make in the film as well. Exactly, but you and I also agree that part 2 which came out a few years later, that was the start of the series with who we know as the main character. This was the first really summer slasher, wasn't it? Yeah. And has gone on for what? 20 plus years? Yeah. 30 plus I mean, years. 40 years. 40 years. <laughs> Let's keep going. It's it, well, if they if they pull their fingers out and make another one, it'll be it, it'll be 40 years. But yeah, I think yeah, it's it's around about 28 years is the lifespan of this franchise, isn't it? When you when you take into account the 2008 or was it 8 or 9 entry? Can't remember now, but okay. yeah. Um, yeah, Friday the 13th came out on May the 9th, 1980, directed by Sean S. Cunningham. Box office of 59 million, which is bloody good considering it cost half a million to make. And with a 64% rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Now, Darren, did this have a, a cool summer or a cruel summer? I think the summer was pretty cool to uh, Friday the 13th, don't you? Uh, I think they were lining up their, uh, they were lining their pockets with as much money as they. Uh... They made off this movie. Very, yeah. it was very cool with them. It was. It's not the best one in the franchise by a long shot, and it's certainly not the worst. But you know, tune into um, the Slaughtered Lambs episode on Friday the Thirteenth, where we explain all our issues with the film. You know, we dive into that for a good forty-five minutes, an hour, or whatever it is, and uh, and just explain some of the you know kind of ludicrous moments in the movie that just kind of jar with the two of us it's really interesting that both of us have got exactly the same opinion about this but for us the franchise didn't really kick off until part two and probably only lasted what three four movies before it yeah just got- i would say that but where friday 13th started our next movie that came out a few weeks after that was the summer blockbuster and probably the biggest movie of that year wasn't it no question on May 20, 1980, all of us, who were huge Star Wars fans, were treated to this. The Star Wars saga continues. The Empire strikes back at Luke Skywalker. I've been hit! Princess Leia. Give the evacuation code signal. Han Solo. I said you want to be around when I made a mistake. Well, this could be it, sweetheart. I take it back. Oh! And Al Calrissian. C-3PO. Wait, me! R2-D2 and Chewbacca. The new chapter of Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back. And where what somebody and some people will say is the best of the original trilogy. Oh, by far. The best the best film in the trilogy. In, in, not in the trilogy. The best film in the franchise. You know, I mean, it, it depends who you ask. I mean, but if you ask people of our age, they'll all tell you The Empire Strikes Back is by far the best Star Wars movie out there. Nowadays, people are citing, you know, Force Awakens or bloody... Revenge of the Sith or something like that. No, for sure, it's The Empire Strikes Back. And what an entry. What an entry. This movie had everything. Mm-hmm. You know, the great special effects that we all loved, the, uh, the the character arcs that are in this film with Luke's character arc and Vader's character arc and uh, all the drama and the, the emotion in this movie, the big moment when Vader reveals who he is. It was just... Stunning! It was just the perfect Star Wars movie. And you know what? Marvel, uh, Marvel's Endgame did the same thing that Empire Strikes Back did by passing around fake scripts so nobody would, knew, nobody would know how that movie was going to end. No, not at all, no. I mean, it was, you know, they were being careful even back then. And, and as we know, you know, when, when, uh, when they were shooting Return of the Jedi, they were giving the movie fake names. Blue Harvest was Re- Return of the Jedi's um, uh, working title, but we'll get to that in a few weeks. But, um, yeah, directed by Erwin Kirshner, released on May 20th, a box office of $553 million for a budget of $33 million. 94% on Rotten Tomatoes. So I think this was 
this movie was definitely a very, very, very cool summer. Yeah. I, I, you know, it's one of those Star Wars movies that I'll just never tire of watching. Whenever it's on TV, whenever there's a new version of it brought out, I'm there. Those first three movies, or the middle three movies, whichever way you want to look at them, for me, are just, you know, my childhood in a nutshell. Those movies, the Superman movies, fantastic. I, I remember going to see The Empire Strikes Back at the cinema. I remember the day, you know, like it was yesterday. It was absolutely pissing it down with rain. Uh, and we drove to the Bradford Odeon, and uh, all of us a family, all of us went in there and watched it. And I'll be honest with you, as a seven-year-old at the time, I was a little underwhelmed on, for, on the first viewing. Really? That, that downbeat ending, the whole thing with Luke and it, you just being left in the balance at the end there, I was a little down on it. And it wasn't until I got older that I grew to to really understand it more and appreciate how important a movie it is and just how much of a of a middle chapter it is to that um to that trilogy. It's just fantastic. It really is. Now, are you a anniversary watcher or the original cut? They didn't really tinker with it too much, did they? It was already fact, perfect. Yeah, it, it was already perfect, but also the stuff that they did just kind of cor- corrected um uh, a few issues with the, I think, the speeder sequence. Mm-hmm. I think the, there was a little bit more footage of the uh, the Hofwamper. Yeah, I don't think they, they tinkered with it too much. I think there may be a, something with the Emperor as well that they messed with. I think the enhancements they did to Empire Strikes Back were fine. Although I do, like, I do still like to watch the originals. How about yourself? I, I rather... I, I like the originals because that's what I grew up with. Yeah. I... I you know, you tinker with everything. You know, let's not talk about what Return of the Jedi did for the you know the anniversary edition, which you know just kind of <laughs> we know that's Dave McRae's favorite one to watch. You know, is the anniversary editions rather than the originals. Uh, but yeah, I'd rather watch the original cuts without that added fluff. Um, mm. But yeah, but Empire Strikes Back doesn't have too much as compared to the first. Well, I, sh- I shouldn't say the first because it's not the first, the third or the uh, or the fifth one. Yeah, um, yeah. No, I'm sorry. The fourth or the sixth one. Yeah, but uh, certainly going after Empire Strikes Back, only a few days later, maybe a icon movie in horror came out on the 23rd of May, directed by uh, Mr. Stanley Kubrick, in which I think everybody will know what I'm going to say as the title, The Shining. I don't suppose they... Uh told you anything in Denver about the tragedy we had up here during the winter of 1970. I heard a man named Charles Grady is the winter caretaker. From what I've been told, I mean, he seemed like a completely normal individual. But at some point during the winter, he must have suffered some kind of a complete mental breakdown. He ran amok and uh, killed his family with an axe. Well can rest assured, Mr. Ullman, that's not going to happen with me. <laughs> that's right. Mom, do you really want to go and live in that hotel for the winter? Sure I do. It'll be lots of fun. The only thing that can get a bit trying up here during the winter is uh, the tremendous sense of isolation. Is there something bad here? I fear you will have to deal with this matter in the harshest possible way. I did that. I killed you with Manny. You did this to me. Didn't you? I'm not gonna hurt you. I'm just gonna bash your brains. Here's Johnny. So yeah, The Shining. Uh, a few people have asked us to do full episodes on this. I you don't have the strength. It's a, it's I a don't, college, no, I it's do, a college like movie. You're, you're just opening yourself up to some sort of Debate. ridicule if you if you <laughs> if you try and do that, because everybody has a different interpretation of what's going on in this movie. And and I, you know, I I first saw this movie as part of a compilation movie called Terror in the Isles. I don't know if you remember it from the... It came out Pleasance. About, 
Yes, it came out in around about 1984, and basically the movie was like one huge trailer for horror. Um, and I never saw The Shining when it first came out, probably because I was too young and it was too serious a horror movie to uh, for my parents to show me back when I was seven or eight years old. And so I'd seen numerous clips from this movie on Terror in the Isles. And of course, with that documentary, all they do is they show you all the best bits. So it's all the sequences with with Jack running after um, uh, uh, Danny and 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 uh, Shelley. Um, what's her name? Duval. Duval. <laughs> And with uh, with Shelley uh, running after Shelley Duval, and it makes it look like a terrific slasher. Just those out of context scenes, whereas uh, you know Jack's running through the snow or breaking into the bathroom, and so my mum and I decided to rent it out. So at this point, I would have been about eleven years old, and we rented the movie out, and I was bored with it. Eleven years old. I'm off the back of things like Halloween and Friday the 13th and probably around that time, maybe Nightmare on Elm Street as well. And, you know, I'm sitting there watching this kind of two hour plus character study of this guy being, you know, in his descent into madness. Whereas the best bits of the movie I've already seen before and they're they're right in the final 10 minutes of it. Again, it's not until years later when I've seen it numerous times that you start to appreciate the movie more for what it is. Do you think, you know, you appreciate it more than Shelley, Shelley did when she was keep getting yelled at by Stanley Kubrick and it <laughs> yelled at her so much that her hair was falling out. It sounds he like must it have been a bit of a bastard really... to work with. Yeah. I know. I do know a few people that have worked with him and, um, uh, uh and yeah, there's, there's some, there's some great stories out there, but I always find the whole stories behind, um, the shining, the, the making of the documentary Room 237, is it, or something like that? F- fascinating. All that stuff surrounding it is more interesting to me than the actual movie itself. Don't get me wrong, the movie's great, but I do think it is slightly overrated. The best reference for this movie that I've ever found is as a documentary called Film Worker, which is Leon Vitale, is it, I think, who was Stanley Kubrick's right-hand man, who was an actor who was in Barry Lyndon. Uh, and he became Stanley's right-hand man for until you know he died, uh, and he has some great anecdotes and stories and footage as well from the set of The Shining. Uh, so if anybody's not seen that movie, Film Worker, you should check it out because you get a real insight into the mind of Stanley Kubrick and how he operates. And believe me, it's absolutely fascinating. Well, you know, with an eighty-four percent approval rate, I can understand why it has that and why a lot of fans love this movie i certainly can appreciate it i don't want my i don't want to think during movies and this is what the shining has done for me even poor little danny didn't know what the fuck he was filming you know he was like i don't know what the hell i'm doing uh and he made up that red rum with his finger and stanley's like oh put it in and even stephen king was kind of like eh it falls flat with me and i wrote the fucking thing (laughs) 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 but you know it it, it had a, I believe it had a cool summer, uh, right? And it, it had a pretty good budget with a pretty good box office return, didn't it? Yeah, I mean, it, it was a budget of around 19 million, which again, back in 1979, 1980, whenever they were making it, it's a fuckload of money. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> um, when you think about it, it's a hell of a lot of money for a movie that's basically just a bunch of people talking in a house for two hours. You know, it, it the box office global box office ended up being forty six million, but obviously the movies had a life afterwards and and still remains a um, a huge favorite among fans today. I do like it. I, I enjoy it, and every time it's on, I will watch it. And I've grown to appreciate it as I've got older. And um, you know, I, I'm interested to hear what people's theories are about it and things. But for me to do a whole episode on this film, we'd just be asking for it. You and I doing a whole episode on this film would it be like Stanley asking his secretary to print up 500 pages of that, you know, all work and no play make Johnny a dull boy, you know, because he made her print like 500 pages of English in every fucking language he could think of, you know, to, to, to view it in different countries. But you know what? You're right. The budget was a lot back then, but not as much as what he did to help uh, NASA... Uh, 
uh, fake the moon landing so we could beat the Russians. <laughs> uh, so we'll get away from horror right now for a little bit, and we'll talk about a movie directed by John Landis. No, not American Werewolf in London. We're not talking about the, that one. We're talking about this one. John Belushi, Jake Blue. Walk through party in the county jail. Dan Aykroyd, Elwood Blues, the Blues Brothers. They smell bad. You're such a disappointing pair. You contemptible pig. He better pray the police get to him before we do. Dan Aykroyd, John Belushi, the Blues Brothers, a musical comedy rated R. Now play at a theater near you. Yeah, June 20, 1980. The first movie based upon a Saturday Night Live skit. Yeah, they've been doing these characters for three or four years, haven't they? And they were immensely popular, the, the uh, Blues Brothers, especially with Belushi and Aykroyd. So I think, uh, I think Laura Michaels said, you know what, let's see if we could push this out and, and make some real money. Which they did, you know, they, I mean, on a $30 million budget. How much did they gross? I was 115.2 million across the world. And the sad thing was at the time as well that was that people didn't think that that audiences would go and see it because these guys essentially were taking, you know, black music uh, and popularizing it. When you watch it today, it's a fantastic movie and 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 John Landis, you could say was well ahead of his time. You but, know what, if we wouldn't go see this movie if this if the screenplay was shot based upon Dan Aykroyd's original script, because it was like 324 pages long. <laughs> Which is, what, three and a half hours or something like that, that would be. But the version I watched today was two and a half hours long. Oh, you, you missed about four pages there. It, it wasn't a it's, funny movie. It wasn't the format usually used for a screenplay. <laughs> You're not a huge fan, are you? All right. I'm going to give a secret to the um, listening audience here. My wife and my father-in-law love me very much. Think I'm almost perfect. The reason why I'm not perfect is, one, because I'm a New York Yankee fan, and I don't understand or get the Blues Brothers. Other than that, I'm fine. So you're looking at 98% of perfection people. Oh, it's, it's so simple and stupid and fun. Honestly, today I was really laughing at some of the daft stuff in that movie. It, it, and Carrie Fisher as, as Belushi's ex trying to bloody assassinate him all the time. It's just hilarious. You fucking penguins. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? It, 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 was, it was such a fun movie that didn't even uh, Pope John Paul II gave a blessing to it? <laughs> yeah, apparently so. <laughs> apparently so. But there's all sorts of weird things happening while they were shooting it. Um, I think Aykroyd was in a relationship with uh, Carrie Fisher. At the Saved time, her life. He? Saved her life and proposed to her on the set. That is, that how, well. is that how you meant so? <laughs> yeah, he proposed to her on the set. And I don't know whether she said yes or no or what, because obviously it didn't happen. Um, she put the gun to his head next. But yeah, I mean, it was, there was it was fraught as well with problems with Belushi, wasn't it? Because he was just at the height of his addiction then, and you know, he just kept going missing, and you know, getting himself into all sorts of scrapes and breaking his foot using a kid's skateboard. Yeah, <laughs> and they also had to have a security guard for him all the time on set, just to kind of keep him off the substance. Cocaine. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's just say it, cocaine. <laughs> you know, but for the longest time, also, didn't it hold a record for the largest amount of car crashes? Yeah, there's a <laughs> lot of there's some amazing car chases in this film. A huge budget as well, thirty million budget back in nineteen. Well, what would have been oh, nineteen seventy nine when they yeah, made it? Yeah, yeah, Jesus. But it paid off, taking in one hundred and fifteen point two million. Incredible. Yeah. It's not Empire Strike Back money, but. It made that and plus more, and it probably made uh, Belushi a uh, a lister at this time. Yeah, absolutely, and and they were worried as well. You know, this was a cool summer for this movie, oh, but they were cool, really yeah. they were really worried because Aykroyd and Belushi had just starred the year before in 1941 Spielberg's mm -hmm. uh, movie, and with these two back in you know um, starring together. People and, and with the problems on set during during the filming process, the movie gained the nickname 1942 because people were just gonna they, they were thinking that it was just gonna be an absolute disaster. But 
it came out and audiences loved it absolutely loved it and just watching it today as well me and my wife watching it this afternoon we thoroughly enjoyed it the musical numbers are fantastic the comedy spot on it's it doesn't shy away it's kind of you know it's 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 full on r rated and you know it's uh, I just, it's it's a great feel good movie and a uh, and a little cameo with a lot of famous celebrities including the man himself Pee Wee Herman <laughs> yeah Pee Wee Herman <laughs> <laughs> Never mind James Brown and Ray Charles and Aretha Franklin and, you know... Spielberg in there somewhere, you know. <laughs> Spielberg as well. Paul Rubens is in this film. <laughs> as Ray Charles says, I'll put in the black keys for free. <laughs> <laughs> well, continuing with our chuckles and, and, and laughs, Darren, you must have to say that, especially in your line of work, how important is the July 4th weekend? or holiday for movies and being released. Is it important? Is it the is it the official start of the summer? Well not for us because we don't celebrate. Oh that's right, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's huge in the US. I Happy mean, Independence right- Day. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's huge in the US and, and, and obviously that date is one of the dates that everybody tries to, you know, put a flag in the ground on. But no, I mean, the summers, yes, yeah, summers did kind of, it, 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 it used to sort of be more sort of June, July, August, but over the years, it's kind of, the summers got longer and you get films blockbusters as early as May, sometimes even April being released all the way through to kind of the end of August, early September. Um, but yeah, the 4th of July weekend is a huge um, movie going weekend for you guys, isn't it? Surely you can't be serious. <laughs> and that's a nice segue. How much do you love Airplane? Do you love it just as much as I do? Oh, again, again, another one that I experienced with my dad. Um, he took me to... I was ill one day. I was off school. I wasn't feeling too well. He took me to the cinema to see this film. And it was a PG in the UK, or an A, as the ratings were back then. He was... I mean, a lot of it I was, it was just going over my head at seven years old. You know, the visual gags were, were more entertaining for me, like the boobs. Uh, shit. <laughs> the shit hits the fan. <laughs> yeah, the shit hits the fan. But my dad, just seeing my dad enjoying this movie like he did, the way that he laughed, and, and I, to the point where I was actually quite embarrassed um, because he was laughing so loud uh, and actually louder than the, um, the movie itself. It, it, what an experience. What an experience to see this film on the big screen. You know, and with their cast, you would say the cast is almost perfect uh, to, after you watch this movie. I mean, you have Peter Graves playing, you know, Captain Over, who is, it's, it was a very serious actor. You know, we have his, we have his wife to think, uh, thank for this because, you know, his wife is like, no, no, you got to do this movie. And then you have, you know, Leslie Nielsen uh, playing the doctor. You know Lloyd Bridges uh, playing you know the the guy in the tower, but uh, out of all those people, the directors uh, Zuckerberg and, and and Abrams, they were scared to death of Robert Stack. They didn't yeah. know they they knew he was a serious guy, but they found that he was the funniest person to work with, and he absolutely agreed to do it because you know everyone took him as this serious guy. He just he had fun with it, didn't he? Yeah. Well, I think they all did, didn't they? I mean, it was a type of humour. For those of you who haven't seen Airplane, what are you doing listening to this? Because turn off now and put Airplane on. It's po- it is the funniest movie ever made, and one of these movies that that doesn't seem to age for some reason. Okay, you can look the hairstyles and all that kind of stuff, but it kind of matures as it as 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 it as it gets older. And with each viewing that you you have of Airplane. You you find more gags. There's something that you missed the first time around because they're just the gags are flying at you, one after the other. There's so there's sometimes three, four, five gags in a frame at any one time. Just visual sight gags or or people doing things in the background. There's you know people walking through doors that people are pretending to clean. Um, <laughs> it, it's 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 just a roller coaster. It's a gag machine. It really is. Darren, there is nothing funny about pedophile pilots. <laughs> they they had 
I mean, the movie, as I said, was a PG, but if they'd have got their own way, this movie would have... It may have cheapened it a little bit. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think I, I would like the little subtlety. You yeah. Know, because every the, the, the whole point of this movie is when you recognize the gag and you look around and no one else gets it. That's the mm. funniest part. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, I personally like movies about gladiators. <laughs> Well, that was it. If you if you check out the commentary for for Airplane, please tell um, this one. <laughs> th- th- well, th- th- there's there's a few of the anecdotes on that commentary, but I think it's David Zucker or, or Jerry and uh, David Zucker who are doing the the, um, the the commentary, and they talk about the fact that with Peter Graves' pilot, you have all these moments where he's questioning the kid, asking him questions. Sorry, um, like, do you ever hang around gymnasiums and? Have you ever seen a grown man naked? And and initially, and this is the reason why the DVD has a higher rating than the movie itself when it was originally released, was because the the commentary on the DVD is so R-rated that it's up to the rating of the movie, if you like. Basically, they were going to... The, the initial script had Peter Graves asking the kid, have you ever sucked a grown man's cock? <laughs> could you imagine if that came out uh, wow but that was their original plan and there was there was just, just a number of gags like that which they had to kind of tone down because you know the world would have lost its shit even back in 1980 <laughs> but you know with, with a budget of 3.5 million you know making 83 and at that time, the highest grossing comedy of all time, with a 97%, 97% rating on Rotten Tomatoes, I would have to say, a outstanding cool, a very, oh, very cool. For sure. Summer. Yeah. What a, what a summer this had. What a cool summer this movie had. Um, and still, you know, to this day, people watch it like it's the first time they're watching it. Because there's so many gags, you can't possibly remember them all. It's just, you know, and it was such a shame that 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 the whole team kind of didn't go on to make Airplane Two. That was just done by um, Paramount Pictures uh, w- without the involvement of the, the Zucker guys. Um, but we also want to give a, a, a farewell and a rest in peace to Otto, because he's <laughs> sitting in the garage of Zucker and just deflated and dead. <laughs> uh, is he really? Did they still have is, him? They still have him, but he's he's crusty. You can't inflate him without breaking. I'm sorry, you, you can't blow on his tube without him inflating. <laughs> um, but, you know, what? Uh, and hopefully he has a nice, uh, a nice quiet slumber uh, because our next uh, movie, The Dead Rise, don't they? They do. They do. <laughs> July 18th, 1980, saw the release of this zombie classic. Fucking score. <laughs> now, say, Darren, what do you call this movie? It has like 14 names, doesn't it? it? I, I still don't know. I mean, in this country, it was called Zombie Flesh Eaters. Um, I and know you're just US, zombie. It, it was called Zombie, and then it was called Zombie 2. Um, Dawn of the Dead was called Zombie, and this was kind of like an unofficial follow up to Dawn of the Dead, therefore, it was called mm-hmm. Zombie 2. This movie probably has one of the weirdest fucked up scenes I've ever seen in my life. And I'm not talking about injuries. I'm talking about, if, if ladies and gentlemen, if it ever happens again in cinema, a zombie versus a shark. That's a marvelous scene. Because that's not a small shark either. That's a big shark. That's like a, that's a tiger shark. Yeah. There's it's a, a tiger shark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A wah. <laughs> <laughs> it, um, a drugged up tiger shark, actually. Is that what they did? 
they drugged it to almost comatose. It's it's yeah, the guy the, the stuntman's basically fighting a tiger shark. Uh, it, the stuntman's playing a zombie underwater uh, and fighting this fucking tiger shark and pushing it away and the shark's trying to bite him and uh, it's an incredible scene. It's a, a brave old stuntman who did that, but the whole movie itself is um again, I think when I first saw it years ago, I think I saw it a few years after um, Dawn of the Dead. And I was obsessed with the artwork for this. In the UK, we had the the artwork with the green hand coming out of the ground. I don't know if you've seen that one, because in some countries, it's yeah. kind of like the zombie's face that's all rotten. The more recognizable poster on everybody's wall. Yeah, Colin Murdy has one on his wall. A great poster of, of, of Fulci's zombie on the wall. Hey, Colin. Um, yeah, but in the UK it was always the green hand coming out of the ground and I was a bit obsessed with this image. I remember asking my dad, what's this about, what's this about? And he was, oh, it's about zombies and da, 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 all this kind of stuff. And I did rent it and I was slightly, a couple of things. One, it's obviously the, with it being Italian, it's, it's dubbed and dubbed quite poorly in some parts. Even though it's got American actors in it as well, or British actors I think in some cases. Um, the dubbing's pretty pretty bad, but it does have some of the most gut wrenching makeup um, and effects work that you'll see in a horror film, including uh, one that was on uh, your list and my list for gore. The eye splinter scene. Yeah, the eye splinter scene is pretty. Rough. Oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I also want to know where the fuck are those drums coming from. <laughs> You never see them. You never see no, them. No, you never see them. You never see them. But, uh, but but again, a funny thing is that a movie which which did very well in Italy, didn't it? It was it, it grossed very high. Yeah, in fact, it's really difficult to. It's obviously a huge cult classic, um, and it it's really difficult to see exactly how much money this movie took. I know in the U.S., I think it took around about only around about two two hundred thousand k for a budget of around about two hundred and fifty k. But it's 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 at a time when tracking on movies like this wasn't really apparent, and you know, although we know that it's it was a success, it's hard to say uh, to what degree. So you know, I say that it was a cool summer for this movie because of the, the notoriety of it, the fan base. It's a huge cult movie. It obviously did well enough to spawn two sequels, and I'll be honest, I haven't seen either of the sequels. But from what I gather, they're not great, are they? No, no. Uh, I think uh, City of the Dead is one of them. Uh, which... Oh, I thought there was like a Zombie 2 and Zombie 3. Who knows how many of these fucking things are. <laughs> uh, but yeah, but I, I figured out that the movie, this movie in Italy had a budget of 400 million lira. Mm. Now, get your math uh, conversion uh, calculator now. Well, I, I uh, saw that as well, and that's where I got the 250k from. A three, but it made three billion lira, lira. which is more. <laughs> <laughs> three billion lira. Okay, so it did well. The hi- it's it, the it, highest it, grossing <laughs> movie of all time. <laughs> yeah, there's like End Game and Fulci's Zombie. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot of money, but we, we we're giving it a cool. It was a cool yeah, summer for yeah. Zombie Two. Very cool. And speaking of things that come out of the ground, you ever see a movie where some guy is dead set on killing a gopher? Some people belong to the Bushwood Country Club for the fine cuisine. This steak still has marks where the jockey was hitting it. Some belong for the stimulating conversation. I was a, I might, I think I will. And some just don't belong. You think I'd join his crummy snobatorium? Caddyshack, starring Chevy Chase, Rodney Dangerfield, Ted Knight, and Bill Murray as Carl. It's the snobs against the slobs in Caddyshack, rated R. July 25th, 1980, Caddyshack. Directed by the late, great Harold Ramis. I saw this movie for the first time today. I don't know why I've never seen this movie before. How dare um, you? Yeah, I know, but I, 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 no, I, I fucking hate golf. <laughs> <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean you hate golfers? <laughs> I hate golf. I, I wasn't a massive fan of... Um, of Billy Madison. Is it Billy Madison? Not Billy Madison. Happy, Happy Gilmore. Gilmore. Happy Gilmore. I wasn't a massive fan of Happy Gilmore. I liked the opening credits, 
on Happy Gilmore. <laughs> but um, I wasn't... Uh, Caddyshack never never spoke to me at all. It never, you know, there was nothing about it that kind of that drew me in. And I was actually kind of looking forward to watching it this morning. I watched it at um, 9 o'clock this morning. And I thought it was OK. I think it's of its time. And, you know, Rodney Dangerfield, I liked in it. Bill Murray just annoyed the shit out of me in it. I've got to well, be all of his all of his lines were improvised. He really? never had a script. Right. And, and him and Chevy Chase hated each other. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's kind of... There's, there's major history there, isn't there, from the SNL days. But uh, I can understand what you're saying about just didn't get it because... You know, Rodney didn't get his jokes. He felt he he fell flat, and and Ted Knight was was more of a professional, and he was tired and, and pissed that the uh, cast and crew were always partying every night, <laughs> <laughs> and getting pissed drunk. It it was okay. It just feels more like a kind of it, there's no narrative, is there at all? It's just a sort of disjointed sort of collection of sketches, if you like. Yeah, it, you know it. So, yeah, I can understand why some people don't get it, but could you imagine if we got the 250-page-long script this thing was originally uh You're kidding. Written? 250 pages. It was another Ooh. Blues Brother, except for 100 pages less. Uh, wow. But you have to you have to admit that there's some funny moments, even a, even a gopher, you know, uh, sounding like a dolphin. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, so, listen, it, next week we're going to talk about Stripes, and I think that movie's far superior to Caddyshack. I disagree. What? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this will be the last. We're, we're going to start with 1980 and end on 1980. <laughs> Caddyshack you know is okay. It's okay, but I don't get what all the fuss was about. I mean, look what. So Harold Ramis directed it. Um, cost six million to make. Six million on what? Oh, that it's all filmed on a field. <laughs> yeah. I, I can't yeah, even lock it's, uh, you know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and it made forty million, which is good. That's good, you know, for a six million budget too. Yeah, but back in nineteen eighty, seventy three percent, and probably mo- mainly American um, reviewers as well. I would imagine that they've, they've contributed to that seventy three percent. What would you say instead of getting Kenny Loggins? If how much would this movie have gone up more if they originally got Pink Floyd? Do you think their budget would have went up? Because originally Pink Floyd, they wanted Pink Floyd to sing the opening. Oh really? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. They would have That's made it too artsy farsy, right? Yeah, like, yeah. I'm all right. Cha 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 cha. <laughs> <laughs> They could see the, the gopher tripping out on heroin or something, you yeah, know, yeah. instead of dancing. Caddyshack is an okay film. I'm not a massive... I, I think, you know, a few weeks before that we had Blues Brothers, and I think that's far superior to um, to Caddyshack. Disagree. I, I've, I've not really seen much in the way of... When did you first see it? How, uh, probably around uh, 88, 89. Mm. Right, where around I can actually time, get When it. the sequel came out. Yeah, and you know, and uh, that was pro- I probably saw the sequel before the original, like most kids my generation did. Um, then I found that the the sequel was funny, but Caddyshack was funnier, the original um, or the first one, I should say. Uh, but I think you and I could both agree that Airplane's better. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. I, I, t- yeah, I just maybe the the whole sort of unscripted Bill Murray and Rodney Dangerfield, who was a specific type of humour, mm-hmm. um, who actually did quite enjoy in this film. He'd be kind of jiggling around and all that kind of stuff. He was, ma- like he was, making, me, yeah, he was making me laugh. It's, it's fine. It's fine. Uh, it, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's a cool summer movie and, you know, good for it. Well, you know what? They should have took the explosions of that movie, you know, because they, they were exploding the golf course to get this yeah, golfer. Yeah, yeah. And should have used it on our next movie because this this movie actually literally sank. <laughs> <laughs> we have a brace of huge flops for you folks, starting with this one. It's at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. You're talking about 12,500 feet underwater. Which leaves us with only one choice. Are you talking about raising the Titanic? Yeah. It's the biggest job with the highest stakes anybody ever dreamt of. 
August 1st, raise the Titanic. A great concept, right, Darren? A great concept. A, a fantastic idea. And in some ways, they do kind of, I think they do kind of pull it off. But it just, um, something about it doesn't, it's just not plausible at all, is it? No. No, not at all. It, you know that something's wrong because the whole premise is that America and, well, basically the West is still in the middle of a Cold War with Russia, the USSR. And the Allies, because we're still the Allies, you know, the, the UK and the, and the States, there's a mineral that is on the Titanic that would help with a defense system, a missile defense system. Yeah, and just- some, Thwart energy. A nuclear attack, wouldn't it? Yeah. Basically, yeah, yeah, yeah. And everyone wants it, and the only th- the only place they can find it is in a vault in the Titanic, in the middle of the Atlantic, seven miles down. <laughs> so what are they going to do? They're going to raise the Titanic it all in one fucking piece. <laughs> <laughs> now you know something's wrong, Darren. When they tried to get the Titanic model as close to the original as possible, which they did. Every rivet, every shape, they got it so perfect. And then they realized that the ship was too fucking big. The model was too big, so they had to build a bigger fucking tank. So they built the tank. And then they realized as much money as they spent on it, only it cost $1 million less than building the actual Titanic. <laughs> What does that say about your budget that you could oh. actually made a luxury liner? You know? Somebody, somebody somewhere must have got fired for this because, you know, the movie cost it was over forty million to make, oh, and it actually only just made over seven million at the global box office. Um, it was a disaster. This was a cruel, cruel summer for Raise the Titanic. Uh, even the critics just hated it as well, and it's all based around this kind of. This sort of sort of subpar Indiana Jones type character called Dirk Pitt, um, who was who was who was a character from is it Clive Cussler's books? Correct. Yep. Um, yeah, and and w- if you cast your minds forward to a, the sort of late nineties or early two thousands, there was a movie called Sahara with Matthew McConaughey. Now the character that's in Sahara is Dirk Pitt. Um, in this movie, though, he's played by uh, Richard Jordan. The great Richard Jordan. The great Richard Jordan, we yeah. Just, we lost a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he did die young, didn't he? Mm-hmm. Um, and he's not quite the swashbuckling hero in this, is he? He's sort of... Well, he's just a bloody engineer. <laughs> uh, James Bond wannabe? <laughs> yeah. A secretary. Yeah, yeah. But they, they had to go to Malta to, to, to actually film this, to, to, mm-hmm. to get a tank large enough. Uh, and they actually found a, 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 a boat off Greece, which they converted into the Titanic. And when you see it, when they're actually on it and wandering around and that, it's, an, it's a hell of a job that they've done on it. It does look incredible. The thing's all rusty and it's covered in barnacles and all that kind of stuff. Um, I thought that the, the sets and everything, they'd done a good job. But the, the payoff, well, there isn't a payoff. They raised the Titanic, and the fucking mineral's not even on it. <laughs> All right, let's sink it. <laughs> you know, a lot of people thought this was blasphemous, didn't they? You're touching, you know, they've been looking for the Titanic for a long time before this movie came out. Yeah. And the thought that it came up all in one piece was asinine, and to a lot of people, you were disturbing a burial site. That you should never even have touched. And I agree with it should stay where it is. And they were actually thoughts about raising it back when they actually discovered it. But even Jason Robards, he was born old, wasn't he? <laughs> yeah, he was. But he looked he was the sourest fucking mother son of a bitch in this fucking movie. <laughs> he did it for the paycheck. He likes um, he likes um, a seafaring movie. I think he was in uh, Crimson Tide as well, wasn't he? In uh, yeah. you know, in those final moments there. But yeah, he it's um, it's a it's a it's a huge flop. It's one of the I remember at the time they all, always said it's one of the biggest disasters that Hollywood's ever seen. I remember what the producer, um, you know, I, I have a quote here from him, uh, Sir Lou Grade, who I Lou never Grade. I never heard of. He said famously, it would have been cheaper to lower the Atlantic Ocean than to make it. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, probably. Oh, but we're not done with ships, are we? <laughs> no, because... And, and do you know what? I uh, This next film we're going to talk about now um, came out on the same day as Raise the Titanic and was... <sighs> Get your you know, drama mean. <laughs> This is Don Taylor's The Final Countdown. Welcome to the paradox of time, where past and present become one, where the unthinkable becomes real. There are forces in the universe which are only now just beginning to understand. Kirk Douglas, Martin Sheen, Catherine Ross, James Farentino, Charles Durning. Yesterday's history becomes today's adventure in The Final Countdown. Rated PG. With a 47% you know, approval rating on Rotten Tomatoes, I love the concept, just like I did with Raise the Titanic. But actually, this movie, I like more. It could have been done a whole lot better. Yeah. The storyline could have added up it's more. It's a great idea. Oh, it's a fantastic idea. In a, you know, with a budget of $12.5 million, making sixteen, you know, it, it did some. And I, I think the DVD and Blu-ray sales have actually helped it out. Hmm. It ver- it's very Twilight Zone. Yeah. Do you want to explain the concept? So the concept is is that the crew of the USS Nimitz is on a voyage, and they get sucked in some kind of time loop, some kind of you know wormhole in, in Earth, and and wind up going back to 1941, right before the attack of Pearl Harbor. And now you have a modern day ship. You know, aircraft carrier figuring out what to do, whether or not they need to stop the attack on Pearl on Pearl Harbor, because with modern day warfare technology, they would have just decimated everything that was going to come at Hawaii. And the whole thing is whether do we go through with it or not? Yeah, the, the imagery in this film is, is superb. I mean, you've got all those World War Two airplanes fighting jets Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it's it's such a it's such a great idea. Kirk Douglas is there. Um, is it Martin Sheen as well? I think it was a, it was it was a great idea. But although it it opened bigger than um, than Raise the Titanic, it still suffered. I mean, you know, twelve point five million budget, as Frank said, for a sixteen point six million box office, it really died a death. And uh, unfortunately, you know, the movie is good. The movie is good fun. It could be better. But it's, it's passable, I think. And I think it's one of these movies that's possibly kind of ripe for a remake at some time. You know, but th- there is some offensiveness in this movie. I mean, the Japanese pilot that was taken, you know, uh, captured, Soon Tech Oh, he wasn't Japanese, he was Korean. So I'm offended. <laughs> <laughs> I'm offended. You know, but the, the, uh, the F-14, those F-14 uh, Tomcats... They look fantastic. They in the do. Air. Everything looks superb. Those those dogfight sequences are amazing. And didn't the um, didn't the Air Force um, weren't they kind of involved with this or something? If yeah, I the actual right? the actual pilots helped with the filming and everything. I mean, who are you going to get? Okay, here's a stunt guy. We're going to train you for ten hours. There you go. This is the afterburner button. Press it. Yeah, you know the the pilots love the Halloween trimming because they were actually part of the crew. And they actually needed them. But they weren't as loved as the Teamsters because the Teamsters were getting paid a whole lot more. You know, the union, uh, just to drive them back and forth. You know who also didn't love them it was, uh, was Catherine Ross. She didn't meet the pilots. So what did the pilots do to get back to her? Well, as they were showing the dailies, someone wrote in the cockpit window, fuck you, we didn't want to meet you anyway. <gasps> wow. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I never really heard of her. Is she a big time Hollywood actress? Um, yeah, she she was she was in I think The Graduate and Butch Cassidy. So she she has a pedigree. I think she's married to Sam Elliott, right? Yeah. She so she thinks her shit don't stink. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, getting back to the movie at hand, you know, the summer was cruel for this movie, but I think it could have been done a lot better. I like the movie. Well, there, there, we, there was a little bit of a break for two weeks after that before the next kind of major release came out. And it was another slasher. In fact, we end on two slasher films. The first one being August the 15th, Paul Lynch's Prom Night. These are the girls of Hamilton High. Tonight they'll be more beautiful than ever before in their lives. Because tonight 
is prom night. And someone will come to the prom alone just to watch them dance, to see them fall in love, to see them die. <laughs> prom night. If you're not back by midnight, you won't be coming home. Rated R. This is a boring slasher, Frank. Oh, I agree with you 100%. <laughs> Let me get my notes out how much this movie sucks. You know, but you know what? You and I could, would consider this cruel, you know, just to watch it. But the box office says it had a cool summer, didn't it? Yeah, it, it did. I mean, for a, a million and a half budget, Jamie Lee Curtis and Leslie Nielsen, you know, a great cast and 1.5 million budget and 14.7 million at the box office. You'd take that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Any day. And it's, if someone made, if I made this movie and it was my first time and I had a 50% approval rating, I would be fine. I'll take that. You know, that, that's, that's good. But a lot of people, especially in, in our, our family of slasher uh, fans, they love this movie. I, I think it's, you know, I like it when I see Jamie Lee Curtis and Leslie Nielsen dancing to disco. That's, that's probably well, the best thing about this movie, to tell you the truth. Well, the, the problem with that, though, is that uh, six weeks before, we had an Airplane, who did one of the best ever parodies of Disco and Saturday Night Fever in there. And so you cannot take this sequence in Prom Night seriously whatsoever, because um, Robert Hayes and Julie Hegarty ripped the arse out of it. And then you get Jamie Lee Curtis and the other dude with the curly hair, I'm not quite sure what his name was, doing pretty much the same routine, trying to be serious. Six weeks after somebody's just parodied it, it just doesn't work at all. You want my? Do you want my notes on how much this movie's terrible? Go on then. Okay, you ready, everybody? Between the afros and the unibrows, every <laughs> guy looks like my father's wedding photo. <laughs> it, it, he, the, my, my parents were married in the seventies, and everybody looked the same. You know, there, there's that part where you know Nick is about to tell Kim about about how her sister died on that cliff. There, his mouth was open for so long, so close to Jamie Lee Curtis's face. You better hope that he didn't have a tuna sandwich, you know, for the lunch <laughs> break. It's the most awkward scene ever in my life. You know, and I don't think you ever noticed this too, but you know when Jamie Lee Curtis and uh, her friend are changing and they, they, they that, that mirror's uh, breaking and everything, and they go outside to see uh, if anyone left. Did you notice the uh, the sign on that door? Go on. There's two signs. It says, girls changing room. Visitors are requested to report to the office. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to go into the girls changing room, make sure the office knows about it. <laughs> I also couldn't figure out why the, the killer in this film was dressed like some really poor ninja. With glitter? Glitter with, with, a, with, a, with a glitter balaclava on. <laughs> and you know what? The cop has no point either, does he? No. <laughs> it's he, he's, it's he's a cra- dumb movie. He's another pedophile, uh, you know, trying to uh, crash a, a, a kid party. You know, and the worst sex scene I've ever seen in a movie. This fat manatee looking of a guy sliding <laughs> off this girl in the van. Yeah, I look for sure. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Slick is his name. He was yeah, Slick. He was punching. That guy was punching way above his weight. Um a couple of interesting things about this was um so the movie on its first pass at the MPAA was actually a PG. Oh, Christ. And and it would have been the first PG slasher movie ever. So they went away and... But I can't see that they went away and shot much in the way of effects work and, and blood and gore because there's very little in it at all. It, all they do is throw blood around. There's no... Oh, there's a fake head, isn't there? Which isn't such a bad effect, actually. No, it's not, no. Um, uh, but on the whole... It's just people covered in blood. And I think they must have thought, yeah, well, let's just chuck a few pair of boobs in there as well and that'll get the R rating. But yeah, they failed on so many levels trying to trying to make this into a horror film. They really did. Oh, it, it was it, it, Jamie Lee Curtis is actually okay in it. She acts yes, everybody yes. off the fucking screen every time she's on. And and Leslie Nielsen as well just looks like Leslie Nielsen looks like he's he's walked off the police squad set and gone out the wrong door. What is he doing in this film? Uh, I, you know what? What are the two cops doing in this film that get so close to each other, congratulating each other on finding a patient that you know 
uh, escaped a or a hospital or or got paroled or something, they're congratulating each other as if they're going to kiss. <laughs> You know, it's or dance cool. to the music in the hallway during the prom. And, you know, and, uh, if this didn't have, like you said, Jamie Lee Curtis or Leslie Nielsen, it, it, it's still a flop to me. But it just makes it less of a flopper. Yeah, uh, yeah. It, yeah. Glitter. I mask. mean, it's not. It's not something that reached the dizzy heights of Friday the Thirteenth or uh, or Halloween or anything like that. But there's fucking. A further three sequels to this film. There are four, yeah. four prom yeah. night movies. <sighs> Including and a apparent, remake. <laughs> yeah, and a remake as well. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. But, no, 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 uh, no. no, I no. Was, <laughs> uh, but yeah, there are four prom night movies. And the young kid who um, was involved in the killing of the girl at the start, he's in all four movies. Uh, do you understand where he, where the killer is going now? Now, you know what that is? That's that's the when you hear that, that's your time to turn off this movie or walk exactly. out of the fucking theater. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He's just telling you to get out. Go on, get out now. <laughs> now, now. And then the kills are like you said, are all off screen. Yeah. You, you know, and rubbish. Then, one of the worst slashes I've watched. Really is. I don't know what, what people really get excited about this film for because you know, when you look at this compared to something like the burning, there's just no context no at all no no, no and even i would say and we're going to talk about this next um but the, the 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 last film on our list today as a slasher i think is superior even though it's not great it's superior to prom night agreed but before we move on to the last movie there's just a few honorable mentions that we wanted to uh we wanted to get in there uh june 20 was um the village people movie can't stop the music <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to know how the Razzie started, this was the movie. This is one of the two movies. So you can thank Can't Stop the Music for actually winning all the awards in that year for the Razzies. $22 million budget for a musical about the village people. And it made a grand total of $2 million at the box office. Oh. <laughs> a cruel summer for the village people. And at the low, one of the lowest ratings in history <laughs> on Rotten Tomatoes, a seven percent, not a lucky number in this case. But you, but the same day, the exact same day that Can't Stop the Music was released was a movie which I've seen and and as a kid enjoyed, and it does that has a, a an approval rating of eight percent. So only slightly above Can't Stop the Music is the Blue Lagoon. Was it Brooke the actress Shields. in it? <laughs> yeah, Brooke Shields and Christopher Atkins in the Blue Lagoon. Four point five million to shoot that movie, and it took forty seven million with a Rotten Tomatoes score of eight percent. Stunt breasts. A cool summer for the Blue Lagoon. Yeah. Well done. But well, let's continue with the with that with the next movie coming out. Uh, honorable mention, Darren. One one of the one of the best movies that Burt Reynolds has ever done. Smoking and the Bandit, but part two. Yeah, well, the, crit the critics wouldn't agree with you on that because there's only 14% on Rotten Tomatoes. But yeah, Smokey and the Bandit 2, which we kind of considered, you know, whether we should make more of a deal about this, but um, we haven't covered the first one, so we just thought, you know, let's just give it an honourable mention. Mm -hmm. 17 million budget and did a grand total of 66 million, so a huge hit and a cool summer for the Burt Meister. Thank you, Burt. And his moustache. And uh, finally... A movie that Frank accidentally watched the other day. Shh. Stop it. <laughs> August the 8th saw the release of Xanadu. Olivia Newton-John's, um, what would you call it? A, a rock opera or what? I don't know. It's just oh, a, a bizarre a... musical um, with music by ELO, the Electric Light Orchestra. Michael Beck from The Warriors. Dancing in roller skates. With Gene Kelly. Gene Kelly saves this movie, folks. <laughs> anytime, you know, anytime you see Gene Kelly. Now, for those of you who don't know who Gene Kelly is, how dare you? Just think about the guy, the sailor who danced with Jerry from Tom and Jerry. That's Gene Kelly. Yeah. Uh, certainly a marvel, a marvelous movie. Not Xanadu, the other one. Yeah, but you know, when I saw Michael Beck for the first time, you know, I, I saw him in Warriors, and I was like, you know, he was a pretty badass guy. Warriors is a great movie. And then I see him, you know, dancing and singing with... Uh, I'm like, 
where did this guy's balls go? You know, yeah, he, he was he was like the new kid on the block, wasn't he? He was gonna be he was gonna be somebody, but it all went tits up. It really did. He just made the wrong decisions, and um, yeah, that's what happens when you make a wrong decision. You end up in Xanadu. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, bless you, Gene Kelly, you're certainly missed. So our final movie of uh, the 1980 summers, uh, Cool or Cruel, is He Knows You're Alone. On the night before her wedding, every girl is alone. That man who's been following me. Amy, why would anybody want to follow you? I don't know. Now he knows where I live. On the night before her wedding, every girl is frightened. And this time... There's good reason. He knows you're alone. Rated R. This has a cast. This, I couldn't, I watched this, I, I saw this years ago and I watched it again this morning and I just thought, I couldn't remember how big the cast was. It has an Oscar winner in it. It has. So let's, let's just have a look at who's in this movie. So we have Paul Gleason, you know, the teacher from um, The Breakfast Club and one of the cops in Die Hard. Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks' first movie is He Knows You're Alone. Who's was uh, going to die, wasn't he? He was gonna, supposed to die in this movie. He was, but they liked him so much. He was so charming on set that they... I think they filmed his death scene and just didn't use it. It's pointless. It's pointless in being in this movie. He's got no... He has nothing to it whatsoever. And it does feel like the movie outstays its welcome quite a lot. And if they'd have lost his character for the five minutes that he's in it, it could have been a tighter movie. Who else we got? We have James Reborn, who was in Independence Day. You know, he's playing one of the creepy school teachers. And also, Audrey from Vacation is in it. Dana Very Barrett. young Audrey. Yeah, very young yeah. Audrey. I mean, a very young Dana. And finally... Very young Audrey. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, blink and you'll miss it moment, from the Delta Force and God knows how many American ninja movies, Steve James. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it has a cast and certainly it, it's going off the as most slashers were doing and you and i will probably agree with this off the same formula as halloween and it does almost follow that to a t yeah and it, there's there's actually some some really creepy moments in it but they've they're so stolen from jo uh, any number of john carpenter films you know, that kind of blurry vision in the background, that kind of synth sting every time somebody appears. Um, it's it, it, The whole plot revolves around... Um, I'll help you with this. A man being left at the altar, practically. Um, stalking um, a bunch of, of girls that are all engaged, I guess. The weird thing about this is, is that the killer, even though he's not masked, he has these kind of really bizarre eyes doesn't he he's, he's 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 got creepy eyes but he doesn't look out of place today there was no. something about the look of him and the hairstyle like most of the guys in this in this movie tom hanks as well have got these huge mops of curly hair the killer just has just a you know a, just a really neutral haircut that doesn't look mm -hmm. like a 70s haircut or anything like that and when you look at him you think jesus he, he looks like a movie this guy's from a movie in the the last few years, for example, is an interesting choice for a for a, for a killer. Yeah, but you know what? If, if this movie also goes to, goes to prove that you can write a horror movie in like a week, you know, because this movie, this actual movie, between writing it, which took fifteen days, and filming it, which took you know four months, but not not four months, but from beginning of writing to the end of. I guess what the uh, publishing or the uh, yeah. Well, I think from from the from the moment he put pen to paper to actually completion of the movie, yeah, it was around about sixteen weeks. Which short. is how much money but, would you guys save making a movie in fourteen weeks? But I guess I mean it was a small movie. Or it was released right at the tail end of the summer, August 29th, directed by Armand Mastro Mastro Mastroianni. Mastroianni. Guess, Ma Mastroianni. Say Say it, in, say it in Italian, they'll, they'll, in your Italian voice, and everyone will believe you're saying it right. Mastriani. Mastriani. There you go. <laughs> um, it took $250,000 to make and took $4.8 million globally. Ah, oh, that's a, you know, that's a good multiple, is that? Even though it's a low box office number, the production costs were low, it's only 22% on Rotten Tomatoes, and, you know, I think critics were really getting tired by slashes at that point. 
But I'd say the summer was cool to um, to He Knows You're Alone. Slightly. Yeah. Slightly cool. And, yeah. and then uh, probably the better disco than uh, Prom Night. Yeah. Yeah, that Prom Night disco. <laughs> For fuck's sake. Oh, so, yeah. Darren, summing up, 1980, was this a cool or cruel summer for movies as a whole? I think when you look at the amount of movies that we've said were cruel, which are looking at it, including our honorable honorable mentions, was one, two, was only four. So I guess it was a cool summer. It's not my favourite summer of the 80s. Oh, hell no. And when you look at what we've got coming next week, you'll understand why. So, you know, next week we have the likes of Happy Birthday to Me, Arthur, Stripes, Clash of the Titans, Superman 2, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Heavy Metal, Hell Knight, The Cannonball Run, Blowout, and Wolfen. Wolfen, which we haven't yet covered, so I'm really looking forward to that. It's it's 81, not only because I was born in 81, uh, but it was, uh, it was the start of probably more cool summers than anything. Frank was conceived on the evening of the release of Can't Stop the Music. Oh. <laughs> His dad was so excited about going to see that movie. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> Terrible. And probably dressed the same way, too. <laughs> <laughs> Mustache and leather chaps and all. <laughs> but, everybody, I hope you enjoyed this segment and this actually season that we're doing, going through all the years of the decade of the 80s. And this was fun, Darren. I think I think I like this. Yeah, it was good. It was good. And we'll, you know, it, we, we're hoping to put an episode a week out. I hope you guys appreciate that actually taking a look at all these movies and doing these little bits of research that we do does take some time. So we'll try and do one a week. It may be that now and again we do one every two weeks. We'll see how we get on. We're also trying to get a couple of special guests as well. Um, we may have one for 1981, but we'll see. We'll see. And as long as I don't watch, uh, you know, a movie by mistake, stick to the roads. <laughs> the best of luck. <laughs>